Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Butzel Long's webinar, PPP Update, Audits, Loan Forgiveness, and Changes in the Flexibility Act. During this morning's presentation, please feel free to submit questions to the presenters using the GoToWebinar control panel. Our presenters will answer as many questions as they can at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Also, a copy of this presentation will be made available this afternoon on the webinar event page and on Butzel Long's Coronavirus Resource Center on Butzel.com. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce our panelists for today's webinar, Bernie Foos, Justin Klimko, and Brett Miller. Bernie? Thanks, Jonathan. Much appreciated. And welcome, everybody. Happy Monday morning. I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe. Uh, crazy times, to be sure. Um, but uh, we we press on. Um, a couple of things, just some housekeeping things. Number one, my name is Bernie Foose. I am a business litigator here at Butzel Long. I specialize in typically trade secrets, non-competes, franchise, and general business disputes. I also have Justin Klimko, who will be here. He is the president of Butzel Long. He is a business transactional and merger and acquisition attorney. And we also have Brett Miller, labor and employment guru attorney. So three uh, different backgrounds, three different practices of law, all merging and converging on this PPP topic. Uh, a couple things to get out of the way here too is uh, again it's we're entering week 12 uh, here in Michigan of our stay at home order so I am still at home that means I still have at least four co-workers under the age of 10 so if you hear any screams or cries please uh, bear with me so let's kind of get into it so we had a great presentation lined up for you guys today we had prepared it last Wednesday and Thursday we were going to talk about loan forgiveness and potential PPP audits. We had finally received the actual forgiveness application from the SBA. Uh, we had finally received some additional clarifications and guidance, and we thought that we had a pretty good handle on how this was going to close out, what we're going to talk about. Then on Thursday of last week, the House of Representatives went ahead and passed the PPP Flexibility Act by 417 to one. Now it's a good development in that it provides some additional clarity and guidance, uh, but it does change some of the rules and some of the guidance that we've been monitoring and we at least thought we had a handle on uh, up until last Thursday. It is not passed in the US Senate nor signed into law by the president just yet, but uh, our belief and others' beliefs are that it's in some fashion it will be. So we're going to kind of rope that into the conversation today, how it may affect your forgiveness application and what you're doing right now, uh, and maybe some uh, other issues that the act, if it was to be passed, would apply to you. So let's get into it. We're, we'll talk about the PPP program and audits. Uh, Justin will jump in and give you a quick loan forgiveness refresher. Uh, we'll also get into the changes proposed by the Flexibility Act. We will get into determining the forgiveness amounts. Just because the, for, the Flexibility Act may change some of these things, uh, we do believe it is healthy to continue to try to start documenting your forgiveness, playing with the numbers, seeing where you're going to be, and how the act could potentially affect you if it's passed into law. We'll go over the actual forgiveness application as it is now and the necessary documentation that you will need, most likely when you do apply for forgiveness. Many of you out there have already received PPP loans, and most of you, from my understanding, are kind of entering the latter part of the initial period, which is week six, seven, and eight. So many of you will likely be eligible to apply for forgiveness uh, in short order. And those that just got their PPP or are in the process of applying, this will be helpful for you as well. So again, real quick, uh, we've already given a webinar on this and issued a, a gazillion client alerts about the CARES program and the PPP program. Um, certainly those are available on the Butzel Long website and YouTube, uh, and you can go there if you wanted to get some additional background. We really just wanna jump into it and piggyback off uh, what we've already discussed. And most of you 
on this presentation were in our previous presentations. And again, the program itself is designed to provide potentially forgivable loans to companies to meet their payroll costs and pay for other qualifying expenses. All of us were there back in March, had no idea how long the pandemic was going to last, how long people would be forced to stay at home, how long businesses will be shut down. So the idea here was to give businesses, small businesses, a bridge. And the mantra from the administration and Congress was, look, instead of laying off all your people, keep them employed, keep them paid, and we'll pay for it. Again, it's the Paycheck Protection Program. And again, this was an idea, this was a bridge to get us if we can finally get back to whatever the heck normal is, uh, that the, the government, instead of kicking everybody off uh, to unemployment and going through and overwhelming that system, they'd stay with their employers and they could kind of turn that switch a little bit easier once things got back to normal. Unfortunately, we're in week 12. Uh, while some of the restrictions have been lifted in certain states, it's not happening everywhere. And there has been a whole bunch of chaos, confusion, frustration with this PPP program that was passed back in March. There are still, believe it or not, $150 billion worth of funds available uh, in the PPP program. It was initially $340 billion. They passed a second version of it to add another 300 plus billion into it. Uh, in that version though, and as time has gone along, as you guys have probably seen it, uh, there was a lot of anger and people being upset that a lot of well-known companies, companies who you wouldn't think are small businesses were applying for and getting PPP loans. So in that way, they, I don't know, nothing better than calling, I guess, a shame game of shaming people better back into returning some of that money and then the SBA issuing guidance and clarifications to really send a message that this program was designed for small businesses. But the problem is when you pass the biggest rescue package in the history of America and the most expensive one, uh, and you do it as quickly as they did, problems are going to arise. So again, those of you who have probably applied for and received the loan, you know better than most that the rules of the game have changed and changed and changed. The SBA has issued a whole host of frequently asked questions to address the confusion and the clarification. Right now, I just checked this morning, we're still sitting at question 47. More could be added and likely will be added. And we've got a host of interim rules dealing with forgiveness, affiliations, you name it. Uh, again, the, we've played the game and the rules of the game keeps changing as we go in. So if you're frustrated, uh, don't worry, you are not alone. Everybody else is with you. And again, as I, as I mentioned, the, pay, the Payroll Protection Program Flexibility Act was passed by the House last Thursday. Uh, we're thinking that the Senate will get to it this week. So the, the, the two biggest things I want to talk about, we want to talk about today are certainly the forgiveness and certainly the PPP Flexibility Act itself. But I think it's also important for all of you out there to be aware of the potential audit from the SBA. And again, those of you who have applied for a PPP loan, the first certification you made in that two-page application was right here under bullet point one. Current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. What the heck does that mean? You certified, as did every other company. And this is the language a lot of people on TV, our Congress of folks, and even some folks within the SBA are really saying and trying to use to scare people like, hey, you got the loan. Uh, if you didn't need it, watch out because you could get audited down the road. And the loan that you thought you had or the forgiveness that you thought you had could be taken away from you. So you can either return the money or if you decide to keep it, just, just know you may be audited. The problem is, again, what the heck does uncertainty and necessary truly mean? There's not a, an objective, clear, black and white definition. It is extremely, extremely subjective. So the guidance we're giving clients and we give to you 
is to do your best and document your state of mind now as opposed to waiting for August, September, or even 2021 when you go and apply for forgiveness and say, well, I really did need the money. You want to do it now. A lot of companies, uh, if they have board of directors, they're meeting with the board, they're really documenting uh, and doing what we call CYAs. And so, look, the, the market, there's uncertainty in the market. Our vendors are having these issues. Our customers are having these issues. Our suppliers are having these issues. We don't have enough on our credit line or we don't have a credit line such that there's just so much uncertainty out there that we need this loan to keep people employed and keep the business going. A lot of folks have already taken uh, layoffs, furloughs, you name it. Some folks were considering it, documenting that now, uh, even if it's you know six weeks into your program, documenting that now, whether it's through board resolutions or board minutes or emails with your leadership, things like that, will put you in the best position possible if you decide to keep the money and if you decide to apply for forgiveness and if you are exposed potentially to an audit. Now, one of the questions we had early on is, how the heck is the SBA going to audit all the businesses, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of businesses who receive loans? So what they ended up doing in the frequently asked questions and this was a number 46, is they basically said, look, any loan under $2 million is presumed to have comply with the necessary and necessity requirement, okay? Now, again, it's basically a safe harbor. You might, you're likely in the clear if you, if you have a loan for $2 million or under, okay? But the SBA still could audit you for other issues and this still could come up, okay? So in an abundance of caution, even if with this safe harbor language that has been issued, it's still good practice in our opinion to document the uncertainty, to document the need, and to document those things to support that certification down the road, just in case. And of course, if you're over 2 million, you're definitely subject to review. Uh, there has been talk that every single company over 2 million will be audited. Now that's 40,000 businesses at least. I don't know how they'll have the manpower to do that, but again, if you're over 2 million, you should certainly expect that you may be audited and you're gonna to have to justify the uncertainty and the necessity uh, among other things. And Justin, I'll hand it over to you and you can kind of give a, a loan forgiveness refresher. Okay, thank you, Bernie. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another week. Uh, June has come and uh, summer hopefully is on its way. Um, so let's just do a quick quick refresher on forgiveness. Um, there's sort of three basic elements to forgiveness. The first is that uh, PP lo PPP loans are forgivable to the extent that they've been used for eligible purposes. There's specific things on which they may be spent. That's, that's, those expenditures have to occur during the so-called covered period. And we'll talk about what that means. Uh, that's something that will change if the Flexibility Act is adopted and that you have to maintain certain proportions of payroll costs to non-payroll costs um, in calculating your loan forgiveness. Um, in addition to that, after you've calculated the amount of forgiveness, there are a couple of circumstances that may result in the forgiveness amount actually being reduced. One is that if the borrower's workforce is reduced in comparison to an earlier designated period, and we're going to talk about all of these in a little more depth uh, as we go through the subsequent slides. But, F, but uh, FTE or workforce reduction is one of the things. The other is a reduction by more than 25% of the compensation of an employee who makes less than $100,000 annually. Um, those will also result in a reduction of the amount that may be forgiven. So among those elements, let's talk about them specifically. The covered period, again, is the period during which you may expend loan proceeds and get forgiveness. And currently that covered period is eight weeks under the CARES Act as it now exists. The Flexibility Act would extend that to whichever occurs first, either 24 weeks after you get the loan <clears throat> or December 31. So that's a pretty significant extension. 
that has a number of implications. But if adopted, the eight weeks would become 24 weeks. And right now, as I say, the eight weeks starts on the day. In fact, the day you get your loan is the first day of your eight weeks. So expanding it um, would enable more businesses to be able to have eligible expenses paid. And one of the reasons it's been expanded is because a number of businesses who were unable to be open because of state restrictions uh, complained that they, they've gotten loans, but they couldn't expend it on payroll because they couldn't be open. Uh, and even though you're allowed to pay employees who are not working, um, there was still this concern. So the Flexibility Act, if adopted, would extend that from eight weeks to 24 weeks. One thing that's not clear from the Flexibility Act is whether it's either or. Uh, and in fact, the Flexibility Act says that a borrower who already has a loan can elect an eight week period. It's not clear whether you can elect something between eight and 24. It would seem to make sense that after you've spent your, all your funds, you should be able then to apply for forgiveness, but there's nothing, there's no clear guidance in the act itself uh, as to whether or not you could elect something that's between eight weeks and 24 weeks. Now, although the covered period normally will start on the day that the loan proceeds are received, the SBA in guidance has created an alternative covered period that certain borrowers can elect. And the point of doing this would be to try to sync up your covered period more closely with your pay periods. The ability to elect the alternative covered period is only available to borrowers who have a biweekly or more frequent payroll cycle. So biweekly or weekly. Um, if you have a monthly or semi-monthly period, you're not eligible to elect the alternative covered period. The alternative covered period would begin on the first day of the first payroll after the loan was received and it would continue for eight weeks thereafter. So you can defer the clock, the starting of the clock running until the first day of the next payroll cycle if you are one of these eligible uh, borrowers. So eight weeks either from the date of the loan or your alternative covered period would be the period during which you measure whether you've expended the uh, funds that are going to be counted for forgiveness. Now, as we said, there are certain types of expenditures on which you're permitted to spend the funds in order to get forgiveness. There are four things listed on this slide, but I want, to I want you to think of these in two buckets, and you'll understand why when we get to the discussion of the 75% rule and things like that. The, the two buckets would be payroll costs in one bucket, and then the other three items, which are mortgage interest, rent, and utility payments in the other bucket. The last three items are forgivable only to the extent that they relate to obligations that existed before February 15th. So what Congress was essentially saying is, although we'll loan you money to pay these things, you can get forgiveness only if those obligations already existed. You couldn't go out and uh, incur new obligations and expect forgiveness for expenses on those obligations. Okay, payroll costs are the third, uh, uh, one of the items, excuse me, of the permitted expenditures. What are they? So to begin with the compensation, that makes sense, salary, wages, commissions, or tips. There is a limit. You can only be forgiven for the amount that of uh, compensation up to $100,000 annual rate. And for eight weeks, that works out to be $15,385, I think is a number. So for any employee who is making $100,000 or more, the maximum amount that you can have forgiven or included in forgiveness is that $15,385. The regulations do allow um, other things. Brett, I want you to take over now, if you would, and um, talk about these in more depth. Sure. This was a common question we were receiving on the forgiveness aspect of what are payroll costs. Um, clients had issues with bringing people back to work who didn't want to come back because they're making more on unemployment, or maybe they were afraid to come back to work. And so employers were offering hazard pay or bonuses or some kind of additional compensation 
Um, other companies had to simply pay people to stay at home, as you mentioned earlier, Justin. And there's a there was a big question about, okay, well, if we do all this, if we offer hazard pay, if we pay bonuses, is that going to be forgiven? And it was unclear. But the regulations have now come out and said, actually, yes, those amounts would be potentially forgivable. So if you're offering hazard pay, a couple dollars an hour extra for people to come into work, if you're putting them in a discretionary bonus pool during this time, you know, now, if you come into work for COVID, we'll, we'll uh, consider giving you a bonus. We'll pay bonuses during this time period. Pay to people who are staying home and not working because you're closed due to, due to COVID. Uh, again, subject to that $100,000 limitation. These are now forgivable, potentially forgivable amounts. So that's kind of been a, a, a huge question people had because most companies are sort of somewhere having to do one of these issues, hazard pay, bonuses, or paying people some people to stay home. Uh, so that 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 is very helpful clarification, and we already knew some other aspects that you know payment for vacation, uh, parental, medical, or sick leave were covered. Payroll costs. I will caution that um, sick leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act is not covered. You can't double dip because that's a separate program that the government pays for through a different mechanism. You can't use PPP funds for that. But your your typical PTO that your company offers is is forgivable along with severance, uh, healthcare benefits including insurance premiums. Um, we, there's an open question, Justin, on on the healthcare uh, on, on benefits for short term or long term disability. Uh, a lot of the major payroll companies are saying those are included payroll costs under PPP. And in fact, if you request data from your payroll company to fill out your forgiveness application, they may be including in the insurance premium portion what you're paying on short-term or long-term disability. But that's actually still an open question that the regulations, at least that I've seen, have not yet addressed on those short-term, long-term disability insurance programs. How are those gonna be forgivable? Again, the payroll companies are saying yes, but it's still a bit of an open question. Uh, state and local taxes assessed and employee compensation are also included in payroll costs of that that bucket you mentioned of payroll costs those are sort of the the uh big the the big picture so there's also a question though for payroll costs of when they're paid versus incurred we've had a lot of questions under the cares act there's language that talks about um, you know, during this covered period, what payroll costs are paid or incurred, paid and incurred, it was very unclear. Can you, uh, you know, what actual payments are covered? And the regulations have said the payments made during the covering period are included. So that's a pretty clear, uh, you know, statement of, okay, you've, you've made a payment, but some other payments uh, are fall into a more gray area. And Justin, I know you've you've looked a lot at this question of prepayments in terms of something that may not yet be due necessarily, and whether you can prepay for that. And I know you've 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 advised clients on that. What are your thoughts on prepayments? So the interesting thing is that the statute says that forgiveness is available for, and this is the actual quote: costs incurred and payments made during the covered period. A lot of people read that to say costs incurred and paid, but that's not what it says. So costs incurred and payments made, um, is it's two different areas. You get forgiveness for costs incurred during the covered period, you get forgiveness for payments made during the covered period. Now, as Brett's gonna tell you in a minute, it's clear that some costs that are incurred but not yet paid during the covered period may be included. The open question is whether costs that are not attributable to the payment to the covered period can be paid in advance essentially can you pay uh, a couple months advance rent or things like that and throw them in the bucket um, there's no clear guidance on that the statute says that you may not include uh prepayments of interest on mortgage debt but it's silent on other prepayments and that's also true of the sba guidance and it may be the case that since as brett's going to tell you again soon that since these types of non-payroll costs are uh uh, limited to 25% in any event, that there's no real uh, area for abuse. But I guess the real point is that if this gets extended to 24 weeks, 
it's probable that most businesses are going to be able to uh, get their entire payroll cost uh, to to be to soak up all of their loan forgiveness. That they're not going to have to rely so much on other types of uh, expenditures in order to get up to 100% loan forgiveness. The 24 weeks really corrects the imbalance that currently exists. Right now, you were able to borrow 10 weeks of payroll in order to get a loan, but you only could use eight weeks of payroll to ask for forgiveness. So there was an automatic gap. And that's how they kind of how they came up with 75-25. But um, if it's 24 weeks, obviously that gap or that natural mismatch goes away. And that, that's certainly true for the amount incurred. I mean, there's two very different time periods there of, of, of obligations that a company incurs. Uh, as it stands now, the amounts incurred during the covered period, um, as you kind of noted with the alternative periods, the, you know, the, the government has sort of made this more of a common sense approach. So the amounts incurred can be included if they're paid in the next regular, regularly scheduled billing cycle. Um, so that includes compensation earned during the covered period paid on that next regular payroll date, just because the payroll date falls outside of your eight week window. Um, you're, you're, you're paying that obligation at the next regularly scheduled date to cover that last portion of your period. So you're, you're, you're good to go there. And the same thing with rent or utilities, rent uh, often is paid prospectively anyway. But you know, if you're, if your utilities or you're paying these um, for a period that falls outside of your eight week covered period, but it's the next billing date and you're, you're using those funds to pay for it, that is considered to be a, a potentially forgivable expense due to when it was incurred. Um, so payroll costs, again, are, fall under the sort of similar analysis that you mentioned with the alternative covered period and the way those billing dates work. Payroll costs are paid sort of, again, common sense on the day the paychecks are distributed or, you know, if it's direct deposit the day that the borrower originates this ACH credit to make sure that direct deposit hits, um, hits the bank accounts for payroll. Makes sense. That's when the cost is paid. Payroll costs incurred are on the day that employees work, whatever that work day is, that's simple enough. It's a little more complicated for those who have had to pay people to stay at home uh, because they're not working, you're not punching a clock, you don't know what those hours are. In that case, the employer can sort of set a schedule on payroll, um, but it's typically when the employees would have worked. If you have a nine to five employee, those hours are gonna be nine to five. Uh, so it, 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 you line it up essentially with the goal of maintaining the status quo. But I think it's important to note, um, as we were alluding to earlier, that the payroll cost component, we've gone through when they're incurred, when they're paid, but the payroll costs have to be 75% of the amount forgiven, at least 75% of the amount forgiven. And I'll, I'll highlight the, that phrase, amount forgiven, because this is, uh, for many companies, an important, important aspect. Not everyone is going to have 100% of the PPP money that they received. Uh, that they're going to apply for forgiveness on okay so if you're taking a smaller portion of that uh, amount of money you receive in ppp funds and you're applying for forgiveness 75 percent of that amount that you are seeking forgiveness on has to have been spent on payroll that that first bucket you mentioned the non-payroll costs we talked about make up the other 25 percent again of that amount forgiven uh, the flexibility act right now as it's written would change these proportions to a 60 percent payroll 40 percent non-payroll but there's a very interesting change whereas the 75 percent under the current rule is uh, based on the amount to be forgiven under the language of the flexibility act the 60 percent of payroll costs refer to the entire loan amount and again justin i know you've been Kind of digging into that but that to me seems like a pretty significant difference in wording in these two rules right so the current 7525 rule is not in the statute it's in sba guidance and what the sba essentially said is whatever the amount that you get forgiven 75 percent of that has to uh consist of payroll costs but you can have an amount that's smaller than your total loan amount and still get forgiveness you just has to be in that 75-25 ratio. The new act suggests that there's no forgiveness at all unless you've spent at least 60% of the loan on payroll costs. So 
I, I know there's been some question about that. I think uh, Senator Rubio has posed a question directly to the SBA, SBA asking how they would interpret that. But um, that's a, a sort of a different approach than the current rule. So while it's a more liberal uh, rule in terms of allowing greater non-payroll costs, it also has this little hook in it. That's right, and, and it's an important it's an important rule that a lot of companies kind of forget. You, you know, you have to be able to hit that that threshold. Um, and and that comes into play as well because you're you're looking at those limits on forgiveness. Um, you know, we have these two buckets, but you know, to put that money up to be forgiven, you're looking at a headcount. Um, in terms of the percentage of workers you've retained or kept on payroll during your covered period. So the amount forgiven is supposed to be reduced if the borrower reduces workforce. You know, if the headcount drops during the period when you have PPP funds, that your percentage of forgiveness will drop. And I think it's important to note that this is a pro rata reduction. In other words, again, you know, you may not be putting all of the PPP money you have to be forgiven so whatever percentage you want to be forgiven if you have reduced headcount it's a pro rata reduction which can take a pretty big chunk out of your forgiveness amount especially if you're not putting all, all of your ppp funds forward to be forgiven anyway so that's an important note um, the application for forgiveness itself has worksheets and walks companies through pretty specifically how this is calculated but the basics are you take your average monthly full-time equivalent employees during the covered period, currently the eight weeks after the loan hits your bank account, um, compared to the average monthly FTEs for one of two periods the borrower chooses. It's either going to be February 15th to June 30th, 2019, or January 1st to Leap Day 2020. Um, and so, you know, you pick which of those really you can crunch the numbers and see what's more favorable, but that's that's how you come up with the percentage of forgiveness. If you have the same number of FTEs, right, you know, during your time you've had the loan compared to these measuring periods, you get the full forgiveness in theory. So that's um, that's how that is supposed to work. Again, the application really has more details. A big question we had from clients though was, you know, okay, we're, we're measuring these full-time equivalent employees, but what is what is full-time equivalent? The CARES Act doesn't define it. We now know from the regulations and the application for forgiveness that full-time equivalent is based on a 40-hour work week. So if you have someone who works 40 hours or more, it's a one FTE. Um, then you would you could divide the hours of someone working by 40. But again, if they're working overtime or they're still one FTE, it's that's capped at one. Uh, but employers have a choice. You can either calculate the actual FTE percentage based on that 40 hour work week. So if someone works 32 hours, there can be a 0.8 FTE um, and you can do that actual math or anybody who's under 40 hours, you can simply count as a 0.5 uh, FTE and the 40 hour people are one, but you have to be consistent. You can't mix and match these, these different, uh, uh, the, you know, your, your FTE numbers, you have to kind of use that consistently. Um, so that's sort of, that's the FTE definition, that's the basic forgiveness formula, but, uh, you know, Justin, like with everything else with this law, there are exceptions. Right, right. So um, a lot of employers have said, look, I, I'm doing my best to keep my payroll, but I can't control all this. I got employees who I laid off and, and I asked them to come back and they said, you know, I'm doing better collecting unemployment than working for you. I'm not coming back or people may even be quitting for that reason. Um, the SBA has uh, issued some guidance that's helpful to employers in that regard. They're saying that in calculating that FTE uh, reduction penalty, um, you do not have to reduce or count employees that you laid off if you offer to rehire them at the same salary and the same number of hours, or with respect to people that were reduced, perhaps from one a, a full FTE to a partial FTE, if you offer to restore the reduction in hours and they refuse, then you have to document all this, but that will not count. You don't have to count that person is no longer part of your payroll in calculating that pro rata reduction. Um, also, you don't have to count 
employees who are fired for cause, who resign, or who individually request a reduction in hours. And the SBA's rationale simply is, these are things that are not being done by the employer, but rather there are things being done by the employees that are out of the employer's control. And therefore, we're not gonna penalize or make uh, borrowers take a hit to their forgiveness for the fact that these things happen. So that's SBA guidance under the current situation, the current uh, forgiveness rules. The Flexibility Act would adopt some of this also. It, 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 and, and the first bullet point here really is sort of a codification of what we just talked about, that if you can't rehire employees who were employed on February 15th, and you also can't hire similarly qualified employers before December 31, then you will not take a reduction on the FTE reduction penalty portion of, of or reduction portion of forgiveness. The second thing that the Flexibility Act added is if you can demonstrate an inability to return to the same level of business activity as existed on February 15th because you've been compliant with health guidelines such as social distancing, limiting capacity, things like that, you again will not have to take a uh, reduction in, in connection with that. So this is a, a limitation or a qualification, if you will, on the reduction of forgiveness based on your workforce. Now, hopefully these things will work together because you note that the SBA guidance specifically talks about employees who resign or who are fired for cause, and that's not mentioned in the Flexibility Act. So it, it will be hope, we hope that the SBA guidance is not gonna terminate in any regard with regard to um, after the Flexibility Act. We don't think it will because it's still the same act, it's just been amended. But that's, I suppose, a bit of an open question. Now, the second thing Brett talked about, and we just talked about how your forgiveness may be reduced if you reduce your workforce. There's also the second element that your forgiveness may be reduced based on compensation reductions. And the thought here is that to the extent that you've reduced salary or wages by more than, for any individual employee, by more than 25% during the covered period compared to the previous quarter, and now that gets to be a lot, a large, large, large larger period, excuse me, if we go to 24 weeks, but 25% compared to the previous quarter. And what the SBA says is we're gonna look at rates of employment, um, I'm sorry, rates of compensation. So if somebody was making $1,000 a week before uh, the covered period, and then they're making, you reduce them to $800 a week, that's only a 20% reduction that will not cause any forgiveness problems. If you took them down to 70, 7, 000, excuse me, $700, that's a 30% reduction. And so the difference between 750 and 700 would go into your calculation and you multiply that by the eight weeks as currently uh, com uh, com computed and perhaps 24 weeks if that goes to 24 weeks. So there are some things about 24 weeks which maybe aren't quite as favorable. But one thing to note about this reduction is that it only applies to employees who were not paid at a rate of more than $100,000 annually for any pay period in 2019. And there are some nuances there that maybe we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Hey, Justin, real quick, I, I just want to ask you a question because this is this is a question we get from clients a lot. What if you've got Joe or Jane Schmo who are making one hundred and fifty thousand or two hundred thousand dollars normally? OK, well above the hundred K mark. Certainly they're capped for initial calculation purposes uh, for the loan. But are you restricted by the twenty five seventy five uh, issue? Could you take that person who's making two hundred thousand dollars down to 50 and get away with it? Or how does that work? Yes, you could. You could take them down to zero, actually. Uh, when we get into the loan forgiveness application, you'll see that there are two separate tables that you include for your employees in calculating your loan forgiveness. One is for the employees making less than $100,000, and one is for the employees making more than that. And it's only that first table that is used for determining whether this compensation reduction will apply. So there's no limit on what you can reduce people who are making more than $100,000. It isn't that you can only take them to 100, you could take them to zero in theory. Um, I'm not saying that that's what people want to do, but uh, according to the way the act is written, there's no limitation on that. 
Um, Brett, you might want to comment uh, for just a second on how this is applied in terms of uh, aggregate versus employee by employee. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, and and for let's let, I mentioned the pro rata reduction on the FTE headcount. And then to Bernie's question, if you have someone making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year whose salary, yes, on the compensation reduction, as you mentioned, Justin, that 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 you know they're they're above this hundred k threshold. But if you reduce them from a one FTE to a 0.8, for instance, 20% pay cut and you only work four days a week, uh, that could still come into effect on your FTE calculation. So, I mean, company, there's a lot of nuances this companies need to be careful about. And as you mentioned, you know, this, this is a, it's the compensation reduction formula is different than the pro rata. It's not in the aggregate. And we have on the slide, this is a dollar for dollar reduction calculated for each individual employee. So th that that's a significant difference because now for each employee who you have, who makes under hundred thousand, who you've cut by 25%, it's a dollar for dollar reduction over that 25% cut uh, for each employee. So, you know, it, it's going to be a different calculation on the forgiveness application and it's a significant one. Right. And the the funny language about uh, in the first sub bullet point here about employees not paid at a rate of more than 100,000 in any 2019 pay period raises a question. If you paid somebody $1,000 a week, but you gave them a $2,000 bonus at the end of the year, in theory for their final pay period, they drew at more than $100,000 rate. Are they excluded? That would not seem to be consistent with the intent, but it does seem to be what the language says. So again, some still some ambiguities in applying this particular reduction. Now, there are some exceptions. Um, in both the case of the staff reductions and the compensation reductions, the forgiveness will not be reduced if you reverse those reductions by June 30. And the Flexibility Act would extend that date to December 31. Now, Brett, maybe you want to talk about how that's limited by when those reductions occurred to begin with. Well, that, and, and that that's a good point, Justin. I mean, because when, when we're talking about, um, we have a lot of questions on this magic date of either June 30th or December 31st. And if we restore people back to work by, under the current rule, June 30th, there's a couple of factors here. First, you have to be able to still hit under the current rule the 75% payroll. If you are simply bringing people back to work uh, at the end of June and you haven't otherwise been applying your PPP funds for payroll costs, you're not going to be able to hit that. Uh, we have some ideas, some groups, some ways that we're advising clients if you're in this situation. Um, when we we'd have we happy to talk to people offline. But it's not a situation where you want to simply purposely wait until, you know, around June 30th and then say, I'm going to rehire my workforce and be fine because you've still got this 75% issue under the Flexibility Act that extends December 31st. You still have to have 60% for payroll costs. And again, when you do the math, it's just not going to work out. Uh, another, another factor is the period of when the re initial reductions occurred for this safe harbor is limited to February 15th to April 26th. So, you know, when we get these questions from clients about if I bring people back to work, um, it raises the question of, okay, well, when were they first laid off? Because this, this, there's a narrow window that's sort of supposed to be this sort of COVID related layoffs from February 15th, to April 26th that companies I think also need to be aware of. Right. Um, so one thing also to note about this extension to December 31, um, obviously that gives employers more flexibility, but you also have to think about timing here. To the extent you're going to wait to December 31 to bring somebody back, you're not going to be able to ask for forgiveness till after that date. That means your forgiveness definitely will not occur in 2020. If you're a calendar year fiscal year, that means you're going to end the year with a loan on your books. Even if it ultimately gets forgiven next year, you're year and financial statements are going to show that loan on your book. So you got to think about how that will affect any covenants you might have on existing bank financing or any other problems where you have to present your financial statements because you're going to be showing a loan that ultimately may be forgiven, but that as of December 31 will not have been forgiven. 
then the last bullet point in this slide is that the SCBA has come out and said, look, we've got these two different um, factors that could reduce your forgiveness. We're going to coordinate them so that the compensation reduction only applies to a portion that is not attributable to the FTE reduction. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you have an employee that was a full FTE, a 1.0 uh, in the previous period. During the current period, during your covered period, you had to reduce that person to be a 0.5. Obviously, that person is also going to have a reduction in their compensation. And if both of these factors apply, then you sort of take a, a double hit for that on your forgiveness. The SBA has said no to the extent that the compensation reduction is attributable to the FTE reduction, then you will not take the second hit. You won't take the compensation reduction hit for your forgiveness. If the compensation reduction exceeds that, so let's take your employee who was reduced to a 0.5. If you took their reduction, or excuse me, their salary down to 30%, maybe 25% of what they were making previously, then there will be a factor that would be included in the um, reduction based on compensation. So that's something else to bear in mind, but there is at least this coordination to get, that the SBA has come with so that you don't get hit twice for exactly the same thing. Um, Let's move on to the forgiveness application itself uh, briefly. Uh, this was issued on May 22nd by the SBA. It's available online. If the uh, Flexibility Act becomes law, this is gonna have to be changed. Um, it's uh, because it incorporates the current um, rules on things like the 75% reduction and the dates of restoring things. So um, this thing, although it's available, may become moot in its current form because of the fact that the Flexibility Act is out there. Um, it consists of essentially a set of instructions, a form on which you calculate your forgiveness, but then a couple of schedules and worksheets on which you sort of show your work. It's like being in fifth grade math. You gotta show your work in order to get your reduction or get your forgiveness. So um, you will, are gonna have to provide uh, computations and you're gonna have to provide um, some documentation. Um, the basic structure is you list your payroll costs, you list any adjustments for the things we talked about, and then, as I say, you have to provide this worksheet um, that shows, has these two tables on it um, of, the, um, of the compensation of your employees. So, Brett, let me ask you quickly, does this mean that you have to show the entire compensation of your most highly paid employees? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, Justin. Uh, I, I think, and I know you've you've dealt with this more than I have, but I don't think I don't read that as a you know mandatory listing on this section of compensation of your uh, uh, on that section of your highly compensated employees. Yeah. So what what actually happens is in that second table with your employees over a hundred thousand dollars, you only enter fifteen three eighty five for all of them, but you do have to provide to your bank some support for the, their actual compensation. So although it doesn't go on the form, you've got to be have uh, available information that supports um, the compensation that you actually paid, because obviously they don't want you making up employees that you were supporting with the loan. Um, and then 15385 obviously is based on $100,000 a year divided by 52 weeks and then multiplied by eight, which is the covered period. Presumably, if the period goes to 24 weeks, then instead of eight divided by 52, it'll be 24 divided by 52, which comes out to be more like $46,000. But we don't know what, what the uh, application will say about that yet. There are certifications you're gonna have to make when you submit your form. If you'll remember, Bernie talked earlier about the certifications in your loan application and that how uh, the SBA may look into those certifications. And a fraudulent circulation, or excuse me, certification could result in prosecution. You're going to have to make some certifications here too. You're going to have to tell people, tell the SBA that you use the funds only for permitted purposes, that you properly calculated the forgiveness amount, uh, and that you've taken other steps to verify what's in your application. Documentation required, excuse me, uh, is. My slide control is not doing it here. Um, 
three categories of documents. Certain documents you have to include with the forgiveness, certain documents that you have to maintain and have available. And then there's a third category of documents that you may voluntarily submit, uh, but aren't required. You've got to keep those documents for six years, either six years after forgiveness is granted or after you complete repayment, whichever occurs first, and you've got to let the SBA have access to them. I'm now going to ask Bernie to please comment on, finally, on some tax implications from forgiveness. Sounds good. And we'll kind of do a, a little bit of a speed round here, folks, and then we'll get into some questions. I know there's, there's some questions in the queue, uh, and certainly we'll be able to answer potentially some of those questions offline. So number one, back to tax consequences. This is important. Let's say you got a loan for a million dollars or 500,000 or 2 million or 4 million. Forgiveness amounts do not constitute cancellation of debt income. So again, if you got a $2 million loan, you do not or will not have to actually have that as income and you're taxed on it. Sounds great, right? And a lot of folks are saying, oh my gosh, I, not only is it not going to be considered debt income, and I get to use it for my expenses and get all those expenses on my taxes. Holy moly, I could, I could really have a lot of money here at the end of the year. Well, not so fast, folks. Uh, it's not debt income, but the IRS has stated in accordance with the existing principles, the expenses you're going to be using to pay for those forgiveness amounts will not be deducted. So you don't get a double whammy, double dip, so to speak. Uh, it sounded too good to be true at the beginning, right? And, and it certainly, we think it is. Not saying that the uh, IRS or the powers that be won't change that, but I don't foresee that on the horizon. Number two, another uh, important thing here, in the current version, the payroll tax deferral, your eligibility ends when your forgiveness is granted. So right now, if you've got a PPP loan, you are still able to defer your payroll tax into that 50-50 split, okay, into 21 and to 22. But if you were able to get forgiveness in September, that would stop. That's the, what the law is right now. Under the Flexibility Act, though, that would eliminate this restriction if it's passed into law. So even if you got forgiveness in August or September, you could continue to take that payroll tax deferral uh, through the end of the year. Finally, let's say you go through all this whole process and you have your loans not forgiven or a portion of your loan is not forgiven. What happens then? The way the law is written right now, again, it converts to a two-year loan at 1% interest. And again, that principal and interest is deferred for six months after the disbursement of the loan. That's the way the law is right now. That said, if the Flexibility Act is passed, that's going to take the minimum term for new loans. Let's say you haven't applied yet. That would go to five years, five years as opposed to two years. That's a huge benefit. Now, look, a lot of you who have taken the loans, you've already got existing loan documents. The Flexibility Act wouldn't change that per se, but they are saying power uh, borrowers and lenders may modify existing loan terms to confirm conform. So again, if you're with your bank, you've got the two-year 1%, you should reach out to them if you're not getting a portion of forgiveness and see if you can renegotiate and modify those terms. Uh, again, myself, Justin, Brett, Top three here are here to help you guys offline. If, if you need some handholding or some questions or walking through this stuff, again, we've been helping clients kind of paper the record, so to speak, when it comes to that necessity requirement on the audit side and helping clients prepare for a potential audit. We're certainly working through clients uh, with the forgiveness application and stuff. We've got a whole host of other attorneys and different backgrounds, as you can see here, that can help you if you need help offline. Uh, we've already got some questions. Let's, let's kind of go rapid fire. Uh, I will pose the question and then uh, between myself, Justin and Brett, we'll try to get as many answered here as possible in the last five minutes. This first one, Justin, I'll, I'll kick it to you, but Brett, you may want to chime in. Uh, this is kind of a unique circumstance. So for employers or businesses that have both sets of payroll periods. You got bi-weekly with hourly staff and monthly payroll for salary employees or or uh, yeah, semi-monthly for salary employees. If you've got both, Justin, how does that affect the payroll period you start with when you get the loan? 
So there's not a clear answer to that in the statute. My uh, answer sort of practically would be, you could use the alternative period for your um, biweekly payroll and you'd have to use the actual eight weeks for your uh, non biweekly for your, you know, less than that, your salary people, but there's not a clear answer to that. And Brett, if you have, if you wanna to add to that, uh, please go ahead. No, I, there, there isn't a clear answer. I mean, the, the the guidance so far has not really been designed for that sort of unique circumstance. Um, as a practical matter, you know, the, the, the actual pay rate of some of the salaried folks in terms of the forgiveness uh, could also be, uh, you know, a, a, something to be factored in here. But just on the actual time periods, I think you're right. Use the alternative for the hourly uh, because you already have it biweekly and it'll be the cleanest way to do it. But it's it's still an open question. Another question here regarding uh, th th this person has not applied yet for the PPP. They thought that they were, if your business was told that they did not qualify because you had a foreign parent and the foreign parent was too big, such that it took you out of eligibility, can you still apply? There apparently is some confusion out there that as of May 18th, uh, companies that had a foreign parent were told that they could apply. That's not true, real quick, okay? Uh, it's, it's fairly nuanced, but the affiliation rule still applies, folks. So if you've got under 500 employees in the U.S., that's a good starting point. But if you've got a foreign parent or even a domestic uh, parent uh, or any other affiliate, in order to be eligible, you have to add the number of employees to your count. So let's say you're at 300 here in the U.S., but your foreign parent has 5,000 employees in Germany, that's 5,300 in terms of a number of what you need to qualify for SBA for that 500 number. Now there are some codes, NICS codes, that may take the eligibility for a small business to be in 1,000, 1,200, or even 1,500, and that might let you slide if you aggregate all the employees. But again, that affiliation rule is still there. What happened in May was a lot of folks who didn't meet the affiliation rule still applied, still got money. And the SBA through their guidance basically gave them a free pass. The folks that didn't listen to their attorneys or the folks that really didn't understand the rules still applied and got the money, even though they weren't eligible, they got a free pass. But again, anybody after May 18th, uh, the affiliation rule still applies. Bernie, it's after May 5th. Um, the, the thing that happened was the SBA had issued in its FAQ um, one of the questions sort of led you to believe that you only had to account employees in the U.S. And the SBA later said, no, that's not true. But they didn't say that until May 5th. And so they said, OK, because we confused everybody, if anybody applied prior to May 5th, then we're going to let them go, even though they didn't qualify under the affiliation rules. And uh, we, are, we are aware of one client, uh, one company that um, applied and then it sort of withdrew its uh, application based on advice that they didn't qualify, but they had applied before May 5th, and they were able to revive that application with their lender. But anybody applying after May 5th can't rely on that. Uh, the free pass is what he called it. Right. Uh, Justin, this real quick, uh, end year profit sharing plans. We've got a couple questions on this. Profit sharing plans and contributions at the end of the year. Do, do companies estimate and accrue those? Or how do they handle those in your opinion when it comes to forgiveness? Well, again, this goes back to whether you can quote unquote prepay things that aren't due yet. Um, you could treat those, try to treat those as something that accrues throughout the year and include eight fifty seconds of them, eight weeks worth in your forgiveness calculation. It's not clear that that is or isn't permitted. I think you can make an argument that it is. I think if the period goes to 24 weeks, you may not have to worry about that because you may have sufficient costs otherwise that you don't have to include those. But um, there is an argument that that's simply an accrual throughout the year and that you should be able to include the covered period portion of that. And there's no clear statement in the statute that you can't, but we have seen no guidance that says that you can. This goes back to this whole question of sort of prepaying things that aren't due yet. Sounds good. We've got a few more questions and I think we'll go past the time here a little bit uh, just to kind of knock some of these out. Brett, this one's for you. How do contingent employees factor into all this? Uh, are there accommodations for the fact that they do not have set 
and consistent hours. Yeah, contingent employees, right? You know, variable employees, PRN, whatever you call them by industry, may have these very these flex hours that can can really jump around, uh, which can make the forgiveness calculation uh, for those employees really difficult. And so I, I think because the uh, regulations have come out and and kind of given companies a choice of calculating FTE by the actual percentage. You know, if someone is a 0.25 or a 0.3 or a 0.8 or whatever it may be, um, for contingent employees, I think companies should play around with the numbers a little bit. Because remember, the other the other way to calculate that is anybody who doesn't work 40 is an automatic 0.5. So if you have a, a large number of contingent employees within your workforce, it may simply be more beneficial to count them all as 0.5s in your FTE calculation, as long as that matches up with the headcount in your measuring period. So, uh, you know, when you go through the actual forgiveness application, I think companies can sort of plug in the numbers and see what is more beneficial, uh, because otherwise, trying to calculate variable hours could be um, could, could be a little more tricky. All right, let's take one final question. Uh, Justin, maybe you and I can tackle this one. If the original loan request was less than the amount allowed, can additional funds be requested? So again, I, I do know some clients who basically shortchanged themselves. They could have applied for and gotten more money in terms of the loan. And now that they've gotten additional guidance and seen how the process has played out, they'd like to reapply or modify their existing application, or the one that was approved, to get that, those additional funds to be able to use. Justin, do you think that they could do that? My interpretation is they cannot. The stat act clearly says you can only get one PPP loan. Um, so I don't know how, I mean, I suppose someone could try to say, well, it's the same loan, I'm just changing it, but I don't think that would fly. I think that, you know, once you've got loan documentation, you've got a loan and you're not allowed to ask for more. I think that's right. And again, it doesn't hurt folks if you wanted to talk to your bank and see if they'd be willing to modify the existing loan and or application and try it. Sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the oil, but from a legal standpoint, Justin, I think Justin's right. You can't get two PPP loans. And if they consider this a number two, it wouldn't count. So um, thank you to everyone uh, on the line for sticking with us. I know we went a little over a time, but I thought it was worth it. Uh, given the questions and the nuances and the detail that are involved with all this. Both uh, Justin and myself, as well as Brett, are available offline to walk and talk uh, you through this as we're doing with other clients. Feel free to reach out to us or anybody else that's on our Butts Along CARES Act specialty team. Uh, we'll be continuing to monitor the Flexibility Act legislation. If you haven't signed up for your client alerts, uh, please do so, so you can get uh, the alerts when we circulate those. And if uh, more stuff comes out, more guidance is issued, other applications are, are done, we'll likely be doing another webinar as well. So thanks again for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it.